This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Angeles, we were working the day watch out of Intelligence Division. The boss is Captain Brooks. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. The invitation came every year at this time to attend the same get-together at the same place with the same people. I'd never gone. This time, however, I had no choice. It's from my uncle, the one up in San Francisco. Yeah. Aren't you going to open yours? No, I know what it says. You do, huh? Yeah. Wish I hadn't opened this one. Old Uncle Fred wants another five. Five dollars? Well, yes, Joe. What'd you think? Five hundred? I just sent him five dollars. When? Six months ago for his birthday. I can't understand that. Now, what do you suppose a man wants with another five this soon? Why don't you open yours? No, it's an invitation to a party. What kind of party? Alumni Association. High school? No, that night school I used to go to. I didn't know night schools had alumni associations. Yeah, well, this one does. Want me to open it for you? Doesn't make any difference. I know what it says. Well, you never can tell about these things, Joe. Might be a refund on your tuition. After 10 years? No, no refund. Dear selected member, you are cordially invited to an informal gathering of men only Thursday evening, February 6th at 8 o'clock at my home, 4458 Edgewood Avenue. Signed, Paul Reed, Alumni Association President. Well, you gotta go, Joe. You're invited. Worse than that, I got trapped. The guy that signed that letter, Paul Reed, he called me at home last night. They must want you awful bad. No, they don't want me awful bad. They just want to have a good turnout, that's all. There won't be anybody there I know. You've always been a bear for higher education, haven't you, Joe? I try. Well, you've got time for all that. You're a single man. You went to regular college, too, didn't you, in the daytime? Yeah, but that was a long time ago. How long did you go? Not so you'd notice it. About eight months. How long did you go to this night school? Three and a half years. Well, you finally convinced me. Of what? You'll do anything to keep from getting married, won't you? Thursday, February 6th. Paul Reed was a real estate broker with political ambitions. Since leaving night school, we'd met socially one or two times and then purely by accident. Well, this calls for a celebration. Joe Friday at an alumni meeting. Might as well be the campfire girls. I don't know a soul. <laughs> we'll fix that, Joe. You will, huh? Tell me something. You ever hear of the Fielder Militia? Yeah, Paul, I've heard of him. Well, I'm thinking about joining up next meeting. Got the word a few days ago from Frank Baker. I'll introduce you to him. We could use you, Joe. That the reason for this special invitation? Right. What do you think of the outfit, politically, I mean? They're about as well-intentioned as a gun in the ribs. Fielder militia? You must be thinking of some other group. I've read their charter. Reminds me of one that was written in a jail cell about 45 years ago. What? Yeah, a place called Landsberg. The guy that wrote it used to hang wallpaper. Oh, come on now, Joe. I'm serious. Why, the police department hasn't got better friends anywhere than the fielders. That's the sole reason for their existence, to support law and order. I'm familiar with the claim. Well, you ought to be grateful, man. You and every other underpaid cop in the country. Support, isn't that what it's all about? Yeah, support, Paul, but not all kinds. Now, let me get this straight. You're the guy who has to go out on the streets and do the job. And you're telling me the department doesn't welcome all the help it can get? Paul, I can't speak for the department, but I'll say this. We want help. We welcome help. We're getting help from legitimate groups and responsible citizens. Now, that doesn't include people who yell spy every time they hear an accent or who look under the bed at night for a seditionist. It doesn't include racist, white or black, and it lets out people who think lawful protest is unconstitutional or that change is treason. It excludes nuts on either fringe, Paul. The guy who sees an anarchist and every kid with long hair. It excludes the fielder militia. Patriotism? Why, that militia of yours has got a corner on the market. Civil rights? They got them all. Protesters? Shoot them all down. Now, that may be your philosophy, Paul, but it's not mine. And I don't think it's the department's either. We work it a little different in this country. What do you mean? I wear a badge, Paul, not a swastika. Hey, what's going on here? I'm not sure, Frank. 
Joe Friday, right? That's right. Frank Baker. How are you? I overheard your little speech. What do you think, Paul? Lost cause? Afraid so. Oh, maybe not. I didn't catch his breath. Frank Baker, like most members of the militant fielder militia, was an outspoken proponent of law and order. He was also a gun fancier. By 11 p.m., the conversation had gotten around to his favorite subject. Well, tell me, Joe, what kind of handgun do you like? And don't tell me it's that blunderbush you hang on your belt. I managed to qualify with it. I'm talking about a fine weapon, something you'd be proud to own. How about a new putter? Oh, come on, Joe, play the game. All right, the 9 millimeter Browning. How's that strike you? Best handgun ever made. Glad we found something to agree on. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question, Joe, off the record. Be sure you want to, Frank. I know. You're a policeman. I respect that. But how would you like to own a Parabellum sub? You're talking about a submachine gun. That's right. I bet you never heard of it. No, but you'll tell me. Brand new weapons, dependable, rapid rate of fire, minimum rise. Feds missed 500 of them when they knocked over Mendino. Well, who's Mendino? Big runner back in Kansas. You'd like to own one of those guns? Well, now, what would I do with it? Right price, Joe. Why me, Baker? You could peddle all 500 of those guns overseas in the next 24 hours. That's right. If I had the license. The federal firearms license. Starting to seep through, huh? Yeah, well, it takes time. That's what I haven't got, Joe, time. I need that license, and I need it quick. There's a lot of dough at stake, believe me. Is that so? Enough for a lot of underpaid people. What do you got in mind? You've been on the job a long time, Joe. You've rubbed elbows with the guys in the Treasury Department. Go on. That's where the license has come from, Joe, and I need one. Bad. You want me to walk that license through, is that it? A word or two in the right place for a citizen who supports law and order. That's all I'm asking. You don't hear very well, do you, Frank? Perfectly. A while ago, I heard an overworked, underpaid cop trying to sell himself a bill of goods. You're sure of that, are you? I don't hear you reading me my rights. <laughs> Friday, 8.30 a.m. I pulled the intelligence package on Frank Baker. Skipper set up a meeting with the Treasury Department, 10 minutes. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, Baker did big time for ADW. He's a felon, that's why he's pushing me. He'll never get that license. But he thinks you can swing it for him. Yeah, and I gotta keep him thinking that. Intelligence memo from the Treasury Department. A year ago, Baker tried to make a connection with a tool company to fabricate trigger housings for machine guns. Never quits trying, does he? No. He really wants that federal firearms license, doesn't he? So bad he can taste it. There's only one thing bothers me. Yeah, where's he got the gun stashed? 8.40 a.m. Bill and I met with Captain Pierce Brooks and Area Supervisor Jack Courtney from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division of the United States Treasury Department. We had worked with Courtney before. All right. So Baker wants the federal firearms license so he can peddle automatic weapons. We know about his record, but I'm just curious, Jack, has he applied for the license? Yes, and his application uses the address of the Fielder Militia. Now that, and the fact that he's been convicted of a felony, would be grounds to deny the license. How's that, Jack? Under the old law, you could have a license at your home and operate from your broom closet. But not anymore. The new gun act stipulates that you must have a bona fide place of business and be open to the public. Well, wouldn't the home office of the Fielder Militia qualify as a place of business? You know better than that, Joe. Fielder Militia isn't open to the general public, and its headquarters are in Fielder's home. Has Fielder himself ever applied for a federal firearms license? No, he hasn't. And it looks like this time he's holding Baker's coat. And we know Fielder is supplying machine guns, grenades, bombs, you name it, to paramilitary groups all over the country. What we don't know is where he's warehousing them. We suspect it's someplace in your California desert, but it's a big desert. What about that 9mm Parabellum Baker offered me? He'll withdraw the offer. We put Mendino out of business 18 days ago. We seized 500 9mm Parabellum submachine guns. Well, what about the other 500? What are the 500? Those were it, the whole enchilada. But don't let it worry you, Joe. Fielder will service him. He'll have a substitute item. Where does Fielder get them? He steals them. From who? Biggest user we've got, the armed forces. Those big desert maneuvers a while back. You got it. We worked part of that case. Bunch of guys decided Uncle Sam had more ordnance than he needed. They got away with weapons, ammunition, any kind of equipment they could lay their hands on. The military nailed the thieves. We tagged some local buyers. You took over from there. Right. Some of that stuff we still haven't turned. We think it may be hidden in that piece of desert I mentioned. OK, Joe, you know what to do. And play this one cool. Do that. If my guess is any good, he'll hand you a piece of that military ordinance. Yes, sir. Gift wrapped. 5 PM, I called Frank Baker at his home in Sherman Oaks. He invited me over for a drink. Here you go, Joe. If that's not heavy enough, you holler. Plenty, thanks. Ever seen anything like it? Yeah, once. Oh, where? England, the Imperial War Museum. That must be quite a place. I've never seen it. You know, they say you can tell a lot about a man by looking at the place he lives in. You believe that? Sometimes. Only one other thing I want to hang on these walls. A federal firearms license. That's right. You gonna help me? You're about as tactful as some of your hardware. 
pun, Joe. I don't have time. You're pressing, Frank, and that's a sign of ego. I'm not sure I like it. I sized you up in five minutes as a bright cop. Real flattering. You call it ego, I call it ability. The ability to make a decision. How about the license? I made a phone call today. Good for you. The investigation on you has just started. It could take a long time. How's that word again? The agent in charge is a friend of mine. Glad to hear it. Where do you plan to store the hardware? What hardware? The guns you plan to buy and sell, or is the license just to hang on your wall? Oh, here, maybe, out on the desert. Why? Your application doesn't say here. I read it. I figured you would. I also read your LAPD package. I also figured you would. All right, why didn't you figure to tell me that you did time for ADW? Now, you know the Treasury Department won't issue a gun license of any kind to an ex-con. That's going to make it pretty rough to push that license through. Yeah, but you know something, Joe? What's that? You're just a man that can do it. Saturday, February 8th, I met with Treasury agent Jack Courtney. If this thing goes down right, Joe, that guy Baker can lead us to Fielder. Then Fielder's one guy we'd like to clap a lid on. He's always where the action is, here and abroad. He operates like an underground river. We keep sinking wells and we can't hit water. We still don't have one piece of concrete evidence that ties him to those illegal weapons. Did Baker drop anything about the location of that warehouse? No, sir. When I asked him where he stored the hardware, he said here or out in the desert. Pinpointed, Joe, as fast as you can, hmm? Monday, February 10th, 4.15 p.m. You're a bright boy, Joe, but you took a little too long to make up your mind. Parabellums are off the market. We're sold out. But I'll fix you up with something that'll make you just as tall. What do you got in mind? Old military classic, the Thompson. It's a lot of firepower. The way things are on the street today and your job, it's a working man's best friend. You're going to deliver on this one. Seventy bucks to you. You got any more at that price? No, this is for your personal use, Joe. If things work out, we'll take care of your friends later. All right, tomorrow's my day off. How about you and me taking a run out the desert? Not unless you want to shoot jackrabbits. Huh? You pick it up right here. <laughs> February 10th, 5.30 p.m. Baker told you you could pick up that submachine gun in 48 hours, is that it? Yes, sir, that's it. We've got the Baker house and the field of militia headquarters staked out, but I doubt if it'll do any good. He's too smart to send a runner in with that weapon. And you're still no closer to the stash than you were before, hmm? No, sir, that's right. Well, what worries me is he'll deliver that Thompson to you, all right. But if he still hasn't told you where that military hardware is stored, one thing's sure, we've reached another dead end. Let's talk about the buy. Where do you live, Joe? I've got an apartment in the Silver Lake District. It's no Taj Mahal. How many rooms? Living room, bedroom. Sounds fine. Think you can get Baker to turn the gun over to you there? Well, that's a tall order. Yes, I know. But we want to be there to corroborate. And I'd like to see this one prosecuted federal. Any ideas how you're going to get Baker up to your apartment? Just one. What's that? Ask him. Tuesday, February 11th, 9.30 AM. I put in a call to Frank Baker and told him it was important that I talk to him. I suggested we meet at my apartment. At the outset, he was reluctant, but he finally agreed. We set the time for 8.30 that night. Tuesday, February 11th, 8.30 p.m. Frank Baker was prompt. You live in a nice neighborhood. Yeah, it's out of the high rent district. It's all your stuff or it come with a lease. Now, you're not a furniture lover, Frank. You're looking for company and I haven't got any. Well, it's not that I don't trust you, Joe. It's just that I'm a businessman. I play it up close. Now, Joe, what's on your mind? It's your party. You're talking about the collector's item. You're 20 hours early. I didn't figure you'd have it in your pocket, Frank, but that's what I want to talk about. Talk? Two things about our arrangement, both of them bad for you and for me. Now, number one, I don't think it's a good idea for me to be waltzing in and out of your place. I'm known in this town. You never know who might spot me. Number two, maybe it's just my imagination, but my boss has been talking sideways to me. Your boss? The captain. Well, like how? Like nothing definite. It's just the assignments he's been putting me on. Looks like he's been keeping me away from the big stuff. What do you mean? Well, he slid me onto the back shelf as far as important investigations are concerned. Now, I've seen this happen before to guys who try to go into business for themselves. The first thing that happens when the department gets hinky about an officer is they keep him off key assignments. Then they let him run until he braids a long enough rope, then they hang him. Now, you slice it down any way you like, Frank, but when you tote it up, it comes out the best way for you and me both. What best way? That we do business here instead of your place. You got anything to drink? Some scotch. That'll do, but don't spoil it. You know something, Joe? What's that? I get a funny feeling about you. Is that right? I hope I'm right. Thanks. You lived here long? Six, seven years. Nice place. You do your own housekeeping? I got a woman comes in once a week. All nice and tidy. True blue civil service. Joe, I think I got you pegged. You have. Maybe just a little. But it's starting to show around the edges. You're beginning to believe, am I right? Maybe. Maybe he's good enough. Joe, you know how many members we got in the field of militia? Four or five hundred. Closer to a thousand five hundred in this state alone. And I'm talking about dues-paying members, Joe, not sympathizers. And every one of those fifteen hundred started out with maybe. 
You're on the right track, friend. Let me build that up a little for you. No, no thanks. I fly better on one wing. I'll tell you what, Joe. I believe everything you said. I don't think it's too good an idea for you to be seen at my place. And I'm just as concerned about your captain as you are. Don't let it worry. I still got it under control. Oh, I know you have, or I wouldn't be here. And I'll tell you something else. The day's gonna come when I deliver a Sherman tank to you at Hollywood and Vine. That'd never fit in the front seat of my car. Oh, by then, you'll have friends. Thanks for the drink. And we do business here. No, oh, not a chance. I see. You live in a nice neighborhood, Joe, but you're a long way from Hollywood and Vine. Wednesday, February 12th, 8.35 a.m. I filled in the captain and treasury agent, Jack Courtney, on my meeting with Frank Baker the previous night. It was agreed that I should follow through and try to make the buy of the Thompson submachine gun on Baker's terms. There was still an outside chance that he might reveal the location of the hidden military equipment. Bill and I left the PAB and drove across town to Frank Baker's residence. I dropped Bill off two blocks away to connect up with the Treasury Department's stakeout teams. It was 4.30 p.m. If Baker intended to make good on the sale of the Thompson submachine gun, it was time. The 48 hours were up. You're as prompt as I am, Joe. How'd you know I had the merchandise? You said 48 hours. Like a drink? No, thanks. Like see what you're buying? That's why I'm here. This is a personal selection, Joe. Detailed, stripped, cleaned oil, test fired 100 rounds. It's A number one. I know I did it myself. Where'd you do all this? The warehouse. Live a little, Joe. The Thompson submachine gun, caliber 45, M1A1. An air cooled, straight, blowback, action magazine fed weapon. Weight 10 pounds, 13 ounces. Number of groove six. Sights front, fixed blade, rear fixed aperture. Muzzle velocity 920 feet per second. Effective range 200 yards. Maximum range 1,600 yards. Feed system 20 and 30 shot staggered column detachable box magazine. You want me to wrap it up? Or will you eat it here? How many magazines? Two twenties. You won't have any use for a 50 unless you plan to start a war. What about a sling? I'll get you one if you think you need it. Tell me the truth. You ever see a prettier piece of machinery? It's a fine one. I bet you never figured your 70 bucks would buy you that much fun, did you? I brought the cash. Oh, I'll take it easy. There's no rush. How about that drink? You've got something to celebrate now, haven't you? I guess I have. Oh, Joe, this is no schlock operation. When I tell you we got the goods, we got them in all first class. I'm convinced. Let's see, you need a couple of boxes of ammo? I could use them. No sweat. Well, Joe, here's to your new playmate of the month. In other words, you're telling me that all your hardware is in mint condition, like that piece I'm buying. No, I didn't say that, Joe. But most of it's so good, you gotta see it to believe it. I'd like to. I got a call in right now. Everything works out. You and I are going to take a little Sunday afternoon run. Oh, where to? A nice dry place where the climate's good for powder and steel. You mean the place on the desert? Excuse me a minute. Baker here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir, not yet. I understand, sir. Welcome. You know, it'll be easier if I break that down to travel with it. This piece isn't going anywhere. The deal's off. What do you mean? Just what I said. No deal. You know your way out. Wednesday, February 12th, 6.20 p.m. I picked Bill up from his stakeout position, and since my apartment was on the way back to the office, we stopped off to telephone the captain and fill him in. He said he'd notify the Treasury agents. Well, it's too bad. No, it's worse than that. If that lousy phone call hadn't come when it did, we'd have had the whole piece on a plate. Who do you figure was on the other end of that call? It's hard to tell. Obviously, somebody pretty high up in the militia. Could have even been Fielder himself. Who knows? If the Treasury people move in on Baker now, at least there's one machine gun out of circulation. Yeah, and how many more they got stacked up in that warehouse? Yeah. Well, I'll run the unit on in. Check us out. Right, thanks. See you tomorrow. Yeah, if I don't reach for the cyanide. Hello, Frank. Joe. Joe, you may live in a nice place, but these halls are a little drafty. Aren't you going to ask me in? Well, sure. It's just that I didn't expect you. <laughs> you got company? I thought I heard voices. No. Oh, just had the radio on. There's no one here. Come on in. Bet you never expected to see me, huh? I just said that, Frank. So you did, chum, but I'm here, and you're seeing me. I got a little something to drink, Joe. Whatever's left of that bottle of scotch. Keep it neat. Pour it tall. You know, you don't live far from me. It's funny, I never thought about it before, but you don't. You got any vacancies here? I just might move in. That's so true. Now, you, uh, you just sip along with me and listen. I got something to tell you. 
Go ahead, Frank. I'm listening. Well, what do you think happened to me today? The worst thing in my life. They threatened to kick me out of the militia. Clean out. Is that right? No, it's not right, but they did it anyway. Who did it? Top dog, Commander Kenneth J. Fielder himself. That's who was on the phone when you were at my place. Why? Why what? Why'd they threaten to kick you out, Frank? Well, they might as well have kicked me out. They demoted me. I never told you this, Joe, but I was the adjutant commander. Four stars down from the commander himself. Adjutant commander, Joe, of the three western states. California, Nevada, and Utah. Sorry to hear that, Frank. Why'd they do it? You can call me Staff Sergeant Baker from now on. You know what that's like in the militia? I'm a company clerk, that's all I am. And just because you and me are friends. You're helping with that Treasury gun license and me trying to return the favor by selling you the Thompson. But Commander Fielder, he just can't see it that way. And you know something, Joe? What's that? I just missed getting a summary courts martial by that much. Now, you, uh, you got a little more there for a friend? Why are you telling me all this, Frank? Well, after you left today, I got to thinking. Maybe I'd do just like you're doing. Maybe I'd just go into business for myself. Oh, I'll keep up my dues in the militia, but you and me, we were building something toward the future, weren't we? Maybe, but so far it's been a little one-sided, hasn't it, Frank? I give you a shove down the road with the feds, but I haven't collected on my side of the favor yet. Oh, yes, you have. Caliber 45, M1, A1. Same one you saw at my place this afternoon. All right. Uh, go easy on yourself. Half now, half on payday. No, I can handle it. I got it all. We're still in business, aren't we? All right, Frank. We are, but what about the competition? What competition? Well, you and I can split a Thompson between us. They've got a warehouse full, haven't they? Yeah, they do, and I got a backyard full. Three feet down, wall to wall. Grenades, detonators, underwater demolition devices, the works. My backyard's a king-size sample case. A little bit of everything that got buried over in Arizona. Arizona? Yeah, they got a lot of desert down there, Joe. California doesn't have a corner on it. You ought to see that place. The cement block walls, three feet thick. I helped set them myself, 40 feet down. Now, you remember when I first met you, you mentioned something about the Imperial War Museum? Now, Joe, you ought to see this place. You name it, we got it. Mortars, 70 millimeter, recoilless rifles, bazookas, anti-tank guns. We even got 10 500-pound bombs in that place. That's a warehouse and a half, Joe. Whereabouts in Arizona? You take Highway 12, you go 19 miles to Carstairs, turn left for eight miles of a raw sand, and there are three red granite bluffs a quarter of a mile away. Sight in on those dead center, and you come to an old adobe ranch house or what's left of it. East wall, you step off exactly 40 paces east, dig down four feet, and there's a metal trap door. Is that where this came from? No, that's part of my backyard inventory. That's it, huh? That's the whole ball of wax. Frank, you're under arrest. Who are they? Agent Courtney, United States Treasury, and my partner, Gannon. Uh-huh. You'll never make it stick, Joe. Militia's got good lawyers. Oh, it'll stick, Frank. Look at it this way. We're not the only group that believes in a strong America. There are plenty of others all over the country, and they're getting bigger every day. I really don't understand you people. Treasury agents, local police. You ought to understand what we're trying to do. We do. That's why we're closing you down. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 19th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty on both federal and local charges relating to illegal sale and storage of explosives, illegal possession and sale of automatic weapons, and possession of stolen government property. The suspect was found guilty on federal charges relating to illegal sale and storage of explosives, illegal possession and sale of automatic weapons, and possession of stolen government property.